hello and welcome again. Well, the first part of our programme today is about winter vegetables. And I think one of the stars of winter has to be mashed potatoes. And a lot of other people agree with me. Mashed potato is one of my two favourite things to eat, the other being toast. Mash is soothing, it's comforting and it's easy to eat. They're my favourite food. I like them whipped up nice and light and fluffy. I think when you die, if you go to heaven, the first meal you get is mashed potato. And I think, because it'll be so lovely and comfortable and it's the ideal, perfect comfort food. It's like just being in bed. I actually like to make my mashed potatoes with this variety, which is called desire. It's got a yellowish flesh, as you can see inside, and it has bags of potato flavour, which is what I want, is a really good flavour. Now, you start off by peeling the potatoes, and I just wanted to make sure that you understood how important it is to have a really good quality potato peeler. Because what that does is it just takes the very outer, wafery skin away. And the flavour and the nutrients are closest to the skin. So you can see there the, the peeling is wafer thin, and that's the ideal way to cook potatoes with just the outer skin taken away and a really good quality potato peeler. Then the next thing you need to do is you need to cut them into even sized chunks. And here they are in my saucepan. Don't cut them too small, otherwise they sort of go with the water and split up. And if you cut them too large, they'll cook on the outside and not on the inside. Now we'll put them on the heat and turn the kettle on because I think when you're cooking root vegetables, I think they need to be in the water as briefly as possible. The more time they're in the water, I always have this feeling the more flavour goes. So I always put boiling water on them. This is just coming up to the boil now. And don't put in too much water. You want enough water to just barely cover them. Too much water and, I, again, I think you rob them of flavour. So just, just right up to the tops. It doesn't matter if a few little bits are sticking out. Salt, I use two teaspoonfuls, and we've got two pounds of potatoes here, and that will be enough for four to six people. Then as soon as they come up to simmering point, turn the heat down, keep them on the simmer for about 20 to 25 minutes. Now the very best way to test if potatoes are done, or any vegetables, I think, is to use a flat skewer like this one here. And what you need to do is you need to put it into the thickest part of the potato, and if it slides in easily, as that has, we'll try another one just to make sure, if it just slides in easily with no resistance, then the potatoes are soft and ready to be mashed. So what we'll do is take them over to the sink, and the next stage is to drain the water off. If they're not quite cooked, you will get lumps and nothing can remove them. After it's drained, you let the water drain off and then you pour them back into the hot saucepan because what we're about here is keeping them as hot as we possibly can. So back they go. Then the next stage is to add a little bit of pepper. Remember, they've got some salt in them. We'll do a bit of tasting later. Two ounces of butter. Don't forget, two pounds of potatoes, so that's one ounce a pound. And then I'm going to start off with four tablespoons of full cream milk. Mashed potatoes is not the time for skim milk, I don't think. I think it's, um, it's about getting everything as creamy as possible. And now you will read all kinds of recipes in all kinds of recipe books about how to mash potatoes. And I've done them all, and I can assure you that this is actually the best way, is to just use an ordinary electric hand whisk. Now what I'm going to do first of all is just break them up slightly with a fork, like that, just to start them off. And the butter will just melt in as the whisk goes round. Then switch it on slow speed at first. And the slow speed will just continue to break them. And then you just keep moving it round until they're all broken and then you can switch on later, higher, to get them finally into that lovely whipped state. I'm just going to move a bit, a few of the lumps into the middle because they've escaped around the edge, so carry on. 
So quite gentle at first. And then as you feel them begin to give under the whisk, then you can go up to a higher speed and get that lovely, smooth, velvety, whipped effect. Here we go. Now at this stage, you ought to do a little bit of tasting because they might need more salt, a little bit more pepper. And today we're going to make the luxury version. And the luxury version is that you add two level tablespoons of creme fraiche. Now this could be single cream or double cream. But um, again, I'm giving you my personal choice here. I think creme fraiche just gives the one a wonderful flavour. And then back with the um, mixer to just get the creme fraiche whisked in. So now all I'm going to do now is switch my mixer off and just get some mashed potatoes out so that you can just see the lovely, beautiful texture of them there. Lovely and creamy and smooth and fluffy. One of life's real luxuries. Now that's basic mashed potato and I just want to show you now a few more versions. This is mashed potato with garlic infused olive oil. You heat eight tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil for about 50 minutes with three peeled cloves of garlic. After that, add it to mashed potatoes, and just as bread takes up the flavour of the olive oil, so does the potato. Italy meets Britain here. This is fresh pesto sauce bought in tubs from the supermarket, and if you combine it with freshly cooked potatoes, you end up with something called pesto mash, which is absolutely divine served with fish. This is Irish Colcannon potatoes and what I'm doing here is adding sautéed shredded green cabbage and sautéed spring onions to creamy mashed potato. If you want to really indulge yourself you can add more melted butter at the end but even if you don't it does have a wonderful flavour and I think it's perfect for serving with some really good bangers. Well, now we're going to move on from mashed potato to lots of other ideas for winter vegetables. And the first one is parsnips, beautiful vegetable. And if you like roast parsnips, sometimes at this time of the year, you begin to get a little tired of them and want a change. And this is a change. This is roast parsnips with a maple and mustard glaze. Now, you start off with a roasting tray in a hot oven, gas mark 7 or the equivalent, and you heat two tablespoons of a flavourless oil, like ground nut oil, on the roasting tray. And you preheat it for about eight minutes. Protect your hands when you get it out of the oven because it's very, very hot. And then while that was preheating, I steamed some parsnips. And this is three pounds of parsnips. And then you just place the parsnips in the hot oil, putting the round side down for the moment. And then once the parsnips are in the hot oil, turn them over so that they're all rounded side up, like that. And there's a reason for doing this, and that's because the glaze actually goes on better if the round side is up. So that's an important little point to remember. And also for this recipe, I think it's nice to have the parsnips cut nice and chunky, as you can see there. Now they'll go back into the oven now. First of all, a little bit of... Um, freshly milled black, black pepper, same high temperature, gas mark 7 or the equivalent, and the next stage is 25 minutes on the highest shelf. Just before the 25 minutes is up, you can make the glaze, and this is very simple. All I've got here is a tablespoon, a rounded tablespoon of grain mustard, and to that I'm going to add one and a half tablespoons of this, which is pure maple syrup. So that's one and a half tablespoons. And then I'm just going to mix that together. Couldn't be simpler, couldn't be easier. But it's a lovely combination of flavours. So now we'll just take them out of the oven and put the glaze on. The only important thing I have to tell you is that when you're buying maple syrup, just look for the word pure. Because... There are sort of imitation maple syrups around, and they don't have that wonderful flavour. 
and then they go back into the oven, same temperature, and they'll need another 10 minutes. But now I'd like to show you a few more winter vegetable recipes. This is broccoli and cauliflower, which is oven roasted with garlic, olive oil and crushed coriander seeds. This is fennel, which is a mild aniseed version of celery. This has been cooked with a cider and cider vinegar glazed to a dark, lovely caramel, and then it's garnished with fronds of fennel. And what's in this surprise parcel? It's celery cooked inside just in its own juices with a vinaigrette, herbs and some finely chopped pancetta. If you want to draw out and concentrate the real sweet flavour of shallots, simmer them very gently for about an hour and 15 minutes in red wine and red wine vinegar which cooks down to a lovely sticky glaze and tastes wonderful. Now in this part of the programme I want to give those of you who haven't made it before a lesson, a basic lesson, in how to make proper homemade mayonnaise. And you start off with um, two large egg yolks. And what we're going to do is incorporate half a pint of oil into the egg yolks. And first of all, to help us do that, I'm going to add some mustard powder. These are large size one egg yolks, and this is a large rounded teaspoon of mustard powder. The mustard powder gives flavour to the mayonnaise as well. So does this. This is a crushed clove of garlic. Now you can leave that out if you don't like garlic, but I think it does make a big difference to mayonnaise. Then I'm going to add a teaspoonful of salt and some freshly milled black pepper. Some people prefer to use white pepper in mayonnaise, but I don't mind the black speckles. I think they look very nice. Now we'll switch on, first of all, just to get those ingredients blended together. And I'll explain all the principles as we go. You need to have a narrow, something narrow, to make it in. A one-pint pudding basin is ideal, or this jug, which has got a narrow base, because the beaters need to be all the time in contact with the egg yolk. The reason for that is that we're going to add the oil drop by drop, literally. So watch this. Just one little drop, like that. And then another little drop. Now, before you get up and go, let me tell you that I'm not going to be here all night. I have actually timed this, and it does, all in all, take about seven minutes, which I don't think is a great deal of time for what is one of the greatest classic sauces ever invented. It's a beautiful sauce. Now, the oil I'm using is ground nut oil, because I find olive oil is too harsh for mayonnaise. But what you can do is experiment with flavour, and you can add a little bit of olive oil, replace a part of it, say an eighth of it, with olive oil, if you like the flavour. About halfway through, the mayonnaise begins to look really lumpy and thick, but that's actually a good sign, when it looks really lumpy like that, and stiff, and it looks as though it won't take any more olive oil because it's got too thick. So what you do then is you add another ingredient and this is um, white wine vinegar. And what I'm going to do is add about half a dessert spoon or a teaspoon now, switch on the beaters and that will slacken it down and make it smoother. I didn't add enough so I'm going to add a little bit more, another half a dessert spoon or a teaspoon and that will turn it pale and softer. So what we'll do now is just let you have a look at how that lumpy consistency has now gone into something paler and smoother and now we just carry on as before only this time you can begin to add the oil in slightly larger drops, as you'll see. Now I'm just going to add just a touch more vinegar to taste, another teaspoonful, because that's quite lumpy again, and what the vinegar does is it cuts the oil 
uh, flavour, but it also uh, makes the mayonnaise lighter. Last lot of oil's going in now. And be very brave and just let it sort of pour in. And what we have now is the finished mayonnaise that you might consider. Let me just show you the consistency first of all. But this is what a proper mayonnaise should be like. It's sort of almost gelatinous. It just sort of sits up like that on the top of the spoon. And it is absolutely amazingly wonderful. But if you still find that's a little bit thick, you can lighten it by adding two tablespoons of boiling water, and that will lighten it down even more. But I'm not going to do that with this mayonnaise, because I'm going to use this mayonnaise to make a special recipe I want to show you. And that recipe is the first of a little group of recipes that I've been having a lot of fun with lately. And that is trying to revive some of the things I remember in the 60s when I was very young. And the first one is prawn cocktail. Now, prawn cocktail, like many other 60s recipes, has got very bastardised over the years, over the decades. And what I want to do is go back and show you, in case you don't remember, how it should be made. So the first ingredient is proper homemade mayonnaise, which we've just made. And we've made half a pint. And this will make enough cocktail sauce for six people as a first course. And the next ingredient is tomato ketchup. That might surprise you. But this actually is a very special tomato ketchup. It's an organic one. It hasn't got any sugar in it. And it's really true to a proper tomato flavor. And we need two tablespoons of that in our cocktail sauce. Next, um, we need to have some Worcester sauce. And it's a dessert spoon of Worcester sauce altogether. And good old-fashioned Worcester sauce, but has a lovely kick in the flavor. This also has a kick, a few drops of this, which is Tabasco. And then don't put any pepper and salt in, because we had plenty in the mayonnaise. Just do a bit of tasting. Now, just mix all those together. Couldn't be simpler. And then one last ingredient, and that is a dessert spoon of freshly squeezed lime juice. Now, I think in the 60s, that probably would have been lemon, but lime improves it. So that's cocktail sauce for six people. And the way to serve it, I think, is like this, with shredded cos lettuce. It needs to be a crunchy lettuce, shredded rocket. And here I've got little cubes of avocado pear. And you need a pound of prawns, and you divide those between six people, and just place them on the bed of lettuce leaves. Cover it with the cocktail sauce, and then sprinkle a little bit of cayenne pepper over the top. And then I'm just going to garnish the side of the dish with a prawn like that. So that's Prawn Cocktail 2000. Now I'm going to sneak in another one of my favourite 60s starters, and that is just egg with homemade mayonnaise. Well, now I want to show you another recipe from the 60s. This is the first recipe I ever wrote and the first recipe that ever appeared in print. It's beef in beer, but I've updated it, and it's now beef in designer beer. This is two pounds of braising beef that's been cut in cubes and nicely browned. That goes into a casserole and is followed by 12 ounces of onions that have also been browned and cut in chunks. Now add flour, a tablespoon, just to soak up all the juices. Then add some seasoning, two bay leaves, and a few sprigs of fresh thyme. Now the beer, and you use 15 fluid ounces of one of the strong continental beers. Which one? Well, whatever's got the nicest label. Stir, bring it up to simmering point, then pop it in a slow oven, gas mark two, for two and a half hours. Just before you serve it, cover the surface of the casserole with baked bread spread with grain mustard, then top that with grated Gruyere cheese, then flash the whole lot under a hot grill until the cheese is brown and bubbling. Well, no 60s revival meal would be complete if we didn't have something sweet. And the something sweet I want to cast your minds back to is that very popular dessert of the 60s called Black Forest Gatto.
And although it has been cheapened over the years um, in the sort of factory versions you buy in the shops that are really cheap, the real thing, which is a beautiful concoction of light chocolate cake, chocolate mousse and cherries and cream, is just absolutely out of this world. So I think it's about time it had a revival, and I'm calling it Return to the Black Forest. And you start off with a very, very light cake mix. We're going to actually roll up the filling inside the cake, and this cake is made in a tin 13 by 9, and it's made with cocoa powder and eggs and no flour, so that it's very, very light, just sugar, cocoa powder and eggs. And what you do is you bake it very briefly, and when it comes out of the oven, it's puffy, and then it sort of sinks down like this. Now, what we're going to do first of all is you can see the tin is lined with baking parchment, which is non-stick. I'm going to turn it out now onto another piece of baking parchment, but first of all, I'm going to sprinkle this with cocoa powder. And when I mention cocoa powder, this must be proper cocoa powder, not drinking chocolate that has other things in it as well. And what we're going to do is just turn that out and peel off the lining paper, first of all. And the way to do that is to pull it directly towards you. Once you've released it, just release the sides first, like that, and then pull it directly towards you, like that. And then it comes off quite easily. That's it. And now I hope you can just see how lovely and light and spongy the texture of the cake is. Now we're going to give it some filling. And first of all, I want to talk to you about the cherries. Now, the cherries must be Morello cherries because they're bitter cherries, not too sweet. And the best way to buy Morello cherries is in a jar like this. And then what you do is you empty the contents of the jar into a sieve, drain off the syrup, and then you leave them to soak overnight with two tablespoons of liqueur, cherry brandy, in fact. Two tablespoons of liqueur has been on the cherries overnight, and now I've drained the liqueur off, and the first thing I'm going to do is take about a tablespoon of that, that's still got some cherry juice there in it, and just sprinkle it very, very lightly over the surface of the cake, and you can see that it soaks in quite easily. So that'll give it an extra sort of moist, squidgy centre. And the rest of the liqueur is going to be used later on. Now the next part of the filling is this, and this is just a plain and simple chocolate mousse made with eggs and chocolate, dark chocolate. And what I'm going to do with that now, you make the chocolate mousse well ahead, and you'll need to put it in the refrigerator to sort of firm up, then take it out of the refrigerator and let it come back to room temperature. And the reason it needs to come back to room temperature is because what you've now got to do is spread it over the mixture. Now, if you think this is really wicked, you haven't seen anything yet, because after the chocolate mousse, the next thing we're going to use is this. This is eight fluid ounces of double cream that's been whipped to a spreadable consistency, and that goes on next. Don't let the cream go to the edge, though. Just keep it in to another rectangle in the centre, because otherwise it, it makes it difficult to roll up. If you take it right to the edge, it all squidges out, which isn't what we want. Right. Now for the cherries, um, which remember, have been soaked in cherry brandy. They're going to go on next. And they go on top of the cream. And just in case you're sitting there trying to count up the calories, let me tell you that this is meant for special occasions. It's meant to be a celebration or a party dessert. And it will actually feed about 10 or 12 people altogether. Now, give it all a little pat. And what we're going to do is roll it up. But Remember, the sacrifice of not having flour in the cake means that it is very delicate, so we're not going to mind if we get any cracks. But we're going to start off by just flipping that bit over and then lifting the paper like that and going over again. Be brave. And there. 
what you've got there is a roll. Now, there is a couple of cracks here, but we're not going to worry about the cracks because we're going to see to those, and a couple of escaped cherries which we'll just stick in at either end. Right, the reason we don't have to worry about those cracks is because we're going to put yet more ingredients together, and I want to show you how to make chocolate curls. We're going to cover um, the whole thing with curls of chocolate. But first of all, they need to stick onto it, and the way you get them to do that is you take really, really good top quality Morello cherry jam like this, a tablespoonful, sieve it, and then melt it in a saucepan. And when you've melted it, you add, remember the other tablespoon of liqueur that we had um, the cherries soaking in? Well, you put that in with the jam, and then you use that, which has the most wonderful flavour, Morello cherries again, to paint all over the surface of the cake so that the chocolate curls will stick. But how to make chocolate curls? Well, what you do is you take three and a half ounces of dessert chocolate and melt it in a pan over barely simmering water. And when it's melted and smooth, you pour it onto an upturned plate that has a diameter of about six inches. Now, this is just an ordinary dinner plate. You could use a flat marble surface or even, a, even an upturned baking tin, but you need to have the chocolate sort of set like that. So what you do next is put it in the refrigerator and give it 45 minutes. Put the timer on because if you leave it longer than 45 minutes, it'll be too hard and you won't be able to make your curls of chocolate. And the way you make them is with this little gadget here, which is in fact a cheese slicer. And these are available everywhere, quite easy to find. And now what you do is you put the cheese slicer flat, absolutely flat on top of it. Don't dig in, be very, very gentle, and then just pull it along like that. And as you pull it very, very gently, you'll get curls of chocolate coming away like that. So there's the first curl. Then you put them into a polythene box and keep them refrigerated because what happens with them is they actually get very, very sticky and they melt very quickly. So we'll just do another one now for you to see. Flat on the surface and holding very, very gently. And if you make a mistake, um, if you make a mistake, and you find it's gone a little bit too hard or it's a little bit too soft. And look, this is all you get. You just get little bits like that. It doesn't matter. The little bits like that still look good. So you can't really go wrong. just needs a bit of practice. So paint the cake with the sealer, the Morello, che Morello cherry sealer. Cover it with chocolate curls and then serve it cut in slices. And listen to the gasps of delight as people eat it. Well, there we are. That's mashed potatoes and other revivals. Hope you enjoy them. And I hope you're going to come back next time. It's our last programme. And in that programme, we'll be going back to good old-fashioned baking. See you then.